morning, the scripture says, praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise Him in the mighty heavens. Praise Him for the acts of, of His power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. And so we're here this morning, first and foremost, to praise the Lord. And so let's look to the Lord in prayer and praise Him. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you. We thank you for all that you've done. As we've already praised you in song, with instrument and voice, but certainly with our hearts, we come before you with thanksgiving for all that you've done for us. And through your Savior, Jesus Christ, we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sin. And so we come to you, Lord, united in spirit. We thank you for your presence with us. And that as we continue our time of worship, may you be pleased to use it for your glory and honor. Guide us, bless us, teach us, draw us closer to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So welcome again. And for those who weren't with us last week, welcome Christine back. And uh, you had a, a little visit, did you? Down south? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah, I went down to Atlanta. Excellent. Hot Atlanta. Yeah, well, it's very hot. We think it's warm. <coughs> good. Glad to have you back with us. And uh, any other announcements that do need to be made? Diane. I am finally allowed to announce it that Brad and Cassandra are expecting another oh. baby. Oh. Oh. She is due in, uh, on the 13th of December, her birthday. Oh. Oh. And uh, yeah, they, are, they were kind of quietly optimistic after the last two times, right. but now everything is going very well. And uh, so I, I told her, can I tell people now? And she said, yes, you can tell them, Mom. Yeah. Well, that's good news, yeah. praise yeah. Good news. And we'll continue to pray for them yes. and the unborn child. Excellent. Just a reminder that men's breakfast in two Saturdays from yesterday, if you're planning to attend, and we encourage you to do so, there is a sign-up sheet outside the door. And the uh, breakfast will start at uh, 9 a.m. So you're more than welcome, Celeste. I just want to say the kids came back from camp on, uh, on Friday, and they're just, they're so spirit-filled, and it's, it's, it's to see it from Kenzie, who wasn't, who just started coming to church, and those little seeds that can plant are just crazy, those seeds just take root. Mm -hmm. Right. Excellent. 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 The seeds have been planted, eh? Hey, now it's constantly praying for ways in which the Lord Good. can water that mm -hmm. seed, mm -hmm. and so there's so many ways in which the Lord can do that, so we need to be praying for our children. Last week I mentioned that we should be praying for Raj, who's in India. I neglected to say, and it's important, that he traveled to India and all that that incurs, whether that be time, energy, finances. And lo and behold, when he arrived there, his family uh, was uh, diagnosed with COVID, so he hadn't been able to visit them. And you know, all that that involved. And Priya, I just want to know, is there an update with his family and everyone's recovered. Oh, yeah. Awesome. awesome. And, uh, I guess that really uh, limited his time because yeah. he's already scheduled to fly back in the next week, I would suppose. Yeah. And so let's awesome. pray that that time will be well spent and uh, he'll make up for lost time. I know he had opportunity to visit with your family, though. That was good that it worked out that way. How was Pauline? How's Pauline? Pauline is uh, still in hospital. They're doing, keeping her for observation and testing. But her spirits are very, you know, Pauline. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm sure the nurses would be thinking if every patient was like that. It would be a happy place to be. But let's be pray for Pauline. Yes. There's a bit of underlying concern that I have. All the testing about, but maybe it's just they want to make sure they're touching uh, all the bases. But let's be praying for Paul. How's Marion? 
Mary? Right there. How are you doing, Mary? Doing okay. Doing okay? Still praying for you. Yeah, that's right. Mary went to visit the day. Going well. Everything's going well. All right. Well, that's good. Okay, so there we go. There are some uh, updates uh, that we have. A reminder next week to uh, come out. We're going to have things a little different. And uh, we trust that you will, uh, we're going to change it up a little. And you'll have to come out to see how to <laughs> change that. It's so exciting. <laughs> All right, so good. And so for the next few moments, uh, as you can uh, feel, uh, this morning it's a little more comfortable in here. Yeah. And you know, this really affords me the opportunity to go over time. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 yes. no, 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 no. Praise the Lord. <laughs> You'll regret what you wish for. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So the air conditioning's in place. And things are different now. Windows are closed. Uh, no noise from the external, and yet we can stay cool. And so thanks to all those involved uh, leading up this, uh, this undertaking and uh, the maintenance and how we're, blessing, we're being blessed from it. All right, if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me? For the next few moments, I'd like to share as we continue our series, Living Under the Sun. Living Under the Sun is such a, uh, an enjoyable thing for us in this region of the world, for most of us who aren't polar bears that actually enjoy a little bit of warmth this time of uh, the year. Uh, we can take full advantage of it. Someone, though, especially in the field of journalism, has referred to this as the foolish, uh, the silly season. And... Uh, the, it's regarded as the silly season from a journalistic point of view because oftentimes there's less news, so they kind of have to make up these frivolous stories and run with them. It's the silly season. However, sometimes I'm reminded that it's the silly season for us as well because we come up and we can sometimes let our guard down because we're just going along. We're kind of in free flow. Uh, uh, mindset, uh, just enjoying uh, the sights and the sounds and the sun, uh, living under it, uh, and yet uh, we need to be careful. And that's why there's the importance of wisdom in Scripture, and certainly uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is no different in offering up uh, some words of wisdom, because when, uh, Proverbs, or excuse me, Ecclesiastes, as we read through it, Oftentimes we're left with despair, disappointment, disillusion, and you know, the big deeds. And, and yet there's always, through this book, there's these rays of light that shine through the clouds and touch us with the warmth of, of the Lord and God's love, and in this case, God's wisdom. And so may we be reminded of that. What is wisdom? What would be your definition of wisdom? This is open. Open mic. Pardon? Think before you speak. Uh -huh. Think before you speak. That's right. Don't what? speak at all. Don't speak at all. Well, let's put it together. <laughs> Knowledge is oh. knowing what to say, and when wisdom is knowing when to say. Yeah. Yeah. Can we come to that conclusion? Yeah. Okay. What other? Uh, how else would you do? Uh, define wisdom. The will of God. Now Celeste is getting spiritual on us. Amen. <laughs> Thanks for bringing us right to the point. Uh, uh, discovering the will of God. And certainly the fear of the Lord is the beginning of this. As it says. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is what? Knowledge is to know that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is to know that you don't put it in fruit salad. <laughs> so that's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Uh, but they're both significant, they're both important. So, if you have your Bibles, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, beginning to read in verse 13. I also saw under the sun, there we go, I'm trying to state it again, this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a 
powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man, poor but wise. He saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength, but the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Mm -hmm. So in these few verses, uh, there's a lot said about wisdom. And, and, and wisdom, the example of wisdom. Considering that Solomon, as conservative scholars suggest, probably towards the end of his life, he came to a point where he realized uh, he had forsaken the Lord, after, and he, he turned back to the Lord, and now we've got the book of Ecclesiastes. And so I, he's, this is a reflection, so to speak, is the book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher, and uh, looking at things this side of uh, heaven, living under the sun, and there's so much, uh, so much hurt and pain, so many things don't add up and make sense. And yet, he still hasn't completely lost his wisdom, has he? He, he's retained that to a degree that he can reflect upon things and he can use an example of wisdom. The example of wisdom that's provided here, there's an example of wisdom, and here it's because he, he provides the epitome of wisdom. But not only is, in other words, the absolute wonderful example of a wisdom is seen here, but also there's the enemy of wisdom. And finally, there's the erosion of wisdom that's uh, also mentioned here. But as we consider here the epitome of wisdom, we have to first look at what's described. He uses this story, this example. There's no evidence of this specific uh, example that he provides where there's a small city and there's only a few people living in it, but this is what he uses. And there is what? A powerful king that makes siege works. Uh, what is siege work? I had to look that up. Siege works and what it actually means. I was thinking of a battering ram banging through the walls and just destroying this poor insignificant little city. But a siege word, it, it, the word siege is from, comes from the Latin seder, which means to sit. And what it would mean, notice that this king, uh, he surrounded it. He surrounded it in such a way that he would not allow anything to travel in or anything to travel out. No provisions could be brought in. No people could escape. In other words, it was meant for the purpose of over a long period of time outweighing the opposition. And before long, of course, in a, in a war, people would starve to death. Or they would just give up because they were starving to death. There was nothing to sustain them. There was no sustainability. So it was over a long process uh, that uh, uh, th there would be attrition and uh, these poor uh, people within this city would end up uh, being defeated. And so that was the plan of the powerful king. And so when we look at this, this poor town, this poor city has nothing going on for it. It's going to be defeated. It's going to be overwhelmed. It's a matter of time. And yet, the epitome of wisdom is found here. Look what, look what it says. There was, a power, there was a powerful king, but there was also what? There lived in that city a man, poor but wise. What a contrast, poor but wise. Why poor? It, it's as if Solomon is going, going out of his way to emphasize that which is less significant seemingly less important, definitely less powerful. And yet this poor person in their wisdom is able to defeat the powerful king. It's not said how. 
So therefore, we can read into it. The Lord is giving us opportunity to make application, so to speak, but we'll try to be careful not to go out of bounds with our application. But if we could make application of this poor, but yet wise individual whom we don't know who it is, we assume it's a real uh, live uh, circumstance or event that took place. But we can make observation. This individual was wise. He was wise and he saved a city. And so we notice Solomon does observe wisdom in the sense that it has an effect. Real wisdom has an effect and an influence. It's not simply neutral. It's not simply there. You know, it, it, as we consider this, we see that um, Matthew Henry, as he makes observation, a man may by his wisdom bring to pass that which could never he do by his own strength. If God is for us, who can be against us? We notice the significance here of one. One. One poor but yet wise individual. Not many. Whereas as we look at the powerful king on the outside, he's able to completely surround the city. But one makes the difference. We are all one Edward Everett Hell, the distinguished poet and former um, chaplain of the U.S. Senate, eloquently captured the essence of this statement by saying, everyone is an individual. I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do that I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I shall do. And so we see this poor, but yet wise individual accomplish so much that he saved the city. Let's go on. What other application can we make? Well, we can certainly make the observa observation here that the poor, the wise man, how can we see this? Well, who was the most despised poor man of all time? At least from a worldly perspective, would be none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? That though he was rich, he became poor. So that through his poverty, we might become rich. He became poor. But not only was Jesus poor, that doesn't mean he was, he let go of his wisdom. That he always demonstrated the wisdom of God, and certainly he is God. And that never left him. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3, where the last statement, last word in verse 2 and verse 3, it says, Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Can we not make application right here and see that this poor, wise man was it who saved the city is none other than a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ? <coughs> Certainly, I don't know if, as Solomon's putting this down, um, that he's thinking, he's projecting into the future, but as we look back on the cross, and recognize that it's the wisdom of God. Certainly it's foolishness to the, to the world, to those that don't, don't believe, but to us who are being saved. It's the wisdom and power of God. And so as we think of this seemingly insignificant poor individual, he has a purpose, and it's to save the city. And that's not all uh, certainly we can make. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the, the weakness of God is stronger than men. Are there times in your life, and perhaps even today is one of them, where you feel overwhelmed? You feel overwhelmed by the enemy 
of wisdom. The king, if, if the poor and yet wise individual represents the Savior, I would suggest that the powerful king represents Satan. And all of, the, all of the power that he has, he, go, he attacks God's people in that city. And yet it's the Savior who comes to their rescue. We need to be reminded that in and of ourselves, we cannot compete, we cannot contend, we cannot fight against Satan and his demons. But yet our strength is not in ourselves and our own abilities. Our strength, as it says there, it says wisdom is better than the weapons of war. In verse um, 18, we need to be reminded that we can't fight this battle using our natural abilities or weaponry or intellect. But the battle is the Lord's. And we're reminded of, of, of where our strength comes from and who our Savior is, and what he's done for us. And finally, we can say one other application. It's about words, isn't it? When it comes to wisdom, we notice that um, Solomon writes the quiet words of the wise. He somehow goes to this seemingly poor but yet wise individual and I don't know if he's still speaking about the same poor and wise individual, but he used verse 17, he describes quiet words of the wise. Was it somehow the wisdom of his words that defeated the enemy? We don't know. But certainly words are important. Words make such a, a significant difference um, and can make such a strong impression upon individuals. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the Word of God. And so words are so important. How our words even should be uh, selected very wisely, not simply knowing what to say, but when to say it, so to speak. Wisdom is better than strength. And the wor our words need to be carefully selected and chosen. As I even think of um, the the wisdom of the world that we can sometimes feel intimidated by, overwhelmed by. I think of uh, the arguments that the world presents in attacking the people of God. And we, it's, how can we keep up with the, the information, the information and technology that is out there? And sometimes uh, we bring in specialists, so to speak, such, such as people from creation ministries, who will go at great length to explain to us uh, how God created everything and to defeat the arguments of um, the secular humanists with all of their wisdom, with all of their technology, with all of their proofs. And we feel overwhelmed that we can look like the doofuses yes. because as, as uh, the, the, the movies would portray the Christians, However, we need to be reminded our wisdom and our words still come from the Lord. And that the Spirit of God might teach us the Word of God. As much as I, I, all, I want to learn more about other things, I need to major in the Scriptures and the Word of God. And that needs to be food for myself and food for others. And so, as we uh, consider the, the enemy of wisdom, as we consider uh, not simply the enemy of wisdom, but the epitome of wisdom, we also have to think of the, uh, the erosion of wisdom. <coughs> and uh, tragic to say, in one sense, or disappointing to mention that this uh, passage ends on a rather uh, difficult note. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. One sinner destroys much good. And so we go back to life under the sun. Living under the sun. And as much as we're trying to do good, and as much as we're trying to build things up, whether that be in our homes, whether that be in our communities, whether that be in our church, and whether that be in our own lives, what does it say? 
one sinner can do what? Destroy much good. It reminds us this side of heaven, there is disappointment. There is discouragement. There's no guarantee that all of the accomplishments and successes of the past or even today, that it will continue on inevitably without some consequences, some attack, perhaps even some destruction. We think of the last two years, how much uh, uh, one, one little virus has caused so much damage. Mm -hmm. So he's in so many different ways. But that is really just a, an example of how all the good that's built up can be taken away so quickly. It reminds us about the, the individual getting back to one. I was thinking of titling uh, this uh, message, Living Under the Sun, The Influence of the One. There's one, there's one poor and wise, there's one king, and then there's one sinner. It's all about one. Mm -hmm. Individual decisions uh, that we make have effects, and certainly long-term effects. And so we need to be reminded, remember, we're, we're here because we worship the Lord. We're here because we know we're forgiven by the grace of God. We're here because Adam did all of this to us in one sense. We need a savior. One decision, Adam. What about Achan? One decision. So much destruction can be uh, caused by one decision. It's the Latin Vulgate uh, puts it this way, not simply, it doesn't say one sinner, but one sin. So all. Oh, yeah, but that's not us because we're not sinners anymore, right? <laughs> we're saints. We're saints saved by the grace of God. There's still that sin in our lives that wants to rear its ugly head in our lives every once in a while in one decision. I wonder if Solomon in some ways just reflecting upon his father in 2 Samuel chapter 11, one sin, all the devastation that was caused by that. And so... Um, certainly Solomon could be thinking about his own life. He doesn't have to look too far. And we can look into the mirror too and say, boy, I'm just one wrong decision away from ruining so much good that perhaps I've invested my life in. I I'm not outside of that from making that one wrong decision, that one sinful decision. We need to realize that there's real consequences the way we do things, the decisions we make everywhere we go, what we look at, how we communicate, we can destroy so much good with one wrong decision. I trust as we go through these summer months, this is not a silly season for us. This is a serious season. We take it seriously. We recognize the one who was poor yet wise that saved us we recognize the enemy of wisdom who wants to starve us out. If he can do that spiritually, he'll do that. He'll wait us out. He's got all kinds of time. And he'll just wait us out. And if he can keep us from the Lord and from uh, following the Lord and the Lord's will and the Lord's will word, he'll do it. If he can, Jesus is protected. Remember, the thief has come to do what? To seek and destroy. To seek, steal, and destroy. That's what the thief does. And may we be reminded also in this serious season that our words make a difference and that the decisions we make, we can make a wonderful impact for good or we can tear down much good with one wrong decision. But let's finish with the positive and let's think of the lad who had, what, five barley loaves, two fish, gave it to Jesus. One act of good ministered to so many. So may we be reminded of that as we leave from here um, and think of the wisdom of God 
wisdom is living under the sun. We need it now more than at any other time because there's so much out there to influence us to live in a life of folly. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks to you. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for all that you've blessed us with, Lord, for the provisions you make daily in our lives, for the wisdom you grant us. Help us, Lord, to, as we think of our wise Savior, we think of the wisdom of the cross. We think of the salvation that's been offered through us. Through it. And we also think of our Savior who's ever interceding on our behalf. Lord, we're reminded that we can take life seriously or approach it in a silly manner. Help us to in our words, in our actions, be mindful that every decision that we make has consequences. So may we be ever mindful of your presence, your power, and live for you according to your word, according in your word. In Jesus' name I pray.